Um, initially, I was going to talk about this sort of uh, uh, coupling problem and trying to figure out where the magnetospheric influences were in the deep ionosphere and get really deep into chemistry and all of these sorts of very confusing things. And then I sat through the first day of the talks here and I realized that it might be completely lost in this crowd. So I went ahead and changed up and I wanted to really talk about um, the ion outflow, the composition of the ion outflow, and how that couples then with the Saturn system in this case. So um, I think we've mostly covered this, but just really quickly, Titan, 2575 kilometers radius body. It's got a huge extended atmosphere, 1500 kilometers from the surface to the exabase. Um, it's mostly nitrogen, some methane, and a whole bunch of, of other tars, goops, various other things are in there. Um, Cassini, we already really covered this, but I wanted to point out that uh, we are now just finished the 98th flyby of Titan and we still don't understand it any better. No, I, I just, we've, we've spent plenty of time trying to understand Titan. It's a very complicated system and, uh, and it's turned out to be just very, very tricky to figure out. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about data from the INMS and from the CAPS, so we have a neutral mass spec and a, and a uh, plasma spectrometer on board Cassini. We already saw this figure, but I've actually taken out the, the last piece of it because uh, uh, Titan doesn't have a bow shock, it's mostly subalphanic. Um, this is an old uh, figure from Norm Ness's paper, sort of showing how the draping works at, at, uh, at Titan. Really, so we're talking about the magnetosphere of Saturn interacting with the ionosphere of Titan. So it's not, you know, its own self's magnetosphere or, or anything like that. We're talking about an unmagnetized body in this case. A and really my goal here is, is to sort of uh, uh, address this picture and try to revise it to some degree. Um, so where is Titan in Saturn's world? It's here. Um, just a little thing sitting out at 20, Earth radii, or 20 uh, uh, Saturn radii. Um, it does float in and out of the, the magnetopause. And uh, there was a very recent flyby in which we actually saw a Titan out in the magnetopause. Unfortunately, of course, the plasma spectrometer is off, which makes us all very sad. Um, but we were able to see many uh, neat effects, and there's a good paper on that by uh, Nick Edberg from, the, uh, 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 from this, the Swedish group. So this picture. Um, so what we're seeing is, is that we're seeing the B field sort of pile up in front of Titan. Titan doesn't have a magnetic field, so it has no protection but it's, it has an ionosphere which sort of allows it to create a cavity within this, uh, this interaction. So this ionosphere is standing off the magnetic field, but the magne ma magnetic field can actually penetrate deep into the ionosphere. And the neat thing about that is, is that you can then have photoionization pulling or placing uh, ions, very heavy ions, onto those field lines. They become mass loaded. You can then bring them down the tail with various processes. So here's what I'm gonna try and talk to you today. I guess we're pretty much done with the introduction now. I'm gonna try and talk very close into the exabase. We've had some very novel new observations there. And then I'm gonna try and talk to the tail region and I, and I will try to explain uh, why we see these sort of dual lobe features. So in, in the Voyager data, we have this sort of cross tail pass at Titan. And, and the thing that was very interesting here, and it's impossible to read from, from here, but um, when you went cross tail, you saw the, the ion spectrum going from mostly light uh, or excuse me, mostly light on this, on this side to mostly, uh, uh, to including heavy ions on this side. And that sort of puzzled me, but also you saw this sort of dual structure. You saw a piece over here and a piece over here, and that's been pointed out in Cassini as well. The other observation from Cassini that's fairly interesting is this. Um, the Langmuir probe uh, showed evidence of this sort of enhanced, this is in electron densities now, enhanced electron densities uh, at very high altitudes from Titan. And they posited that this was this sort of one of these plasma plume types of things. Now this harkens back to thinking of the plasma sphere at Earth, which, you know, last closed equipotentials and all this sort of business. It's really hard to make that with a, you know, an, a, a magnet or a non-magnetized body. Um, so let me, I'll go to that in a second here, but let me show you the observations. Um, during the T40 flyby, we had an, uh, uh, I guess, a fortuitous observation of, of ions mass resolved ions using the Cassini INMS above the ionosphere. And we had never really seen this before. And really we got it because of two things. One, the settings on the instrument were set such that the velocity of the spacecraft wasn't matched up with the velocity of the ions. And two, we went across to roll. And so when we went across the roll, we were able to see in the very narrow INMS field of view, these ions. And this was the first time we'd ever seen this. And the, the key point is, is that we saw 
substantial ion densities out way out here, 2,200 kilometers to, to uh, 3,200 kilometers uh, altitude in mass spins 2, 15, 16, 17, 28, 29, and 39. And in all of these cases, you're seeing uh, what I believe to be ionospheric, uh, uh, ionospheric composition that's actually being pushed down tail. And they're going at about a kilometer per second. So I say, I say here that we have our INMS field of view off the direction of the spacecraft velocity slightly because we're executing a roll. And that actually allows us to get the flow direction in this case. And so you can see they're sort of flowing slightly down tail, though I would actually argue that for the most part, these are kind of radial with a little bit of a twist here. It's a fairly slow flow. So um, the, the composition, the mass spectrum that we actually got from this was really interesting. We're seeing uh, all of this composition, and I, and I show here in the red the composition that we actually got on these 2,200 2, kilometers to 3,200 kilometers. So this is ionospheric. Um, CH3 plus, CH4 plus, CH5 plus. You can't really make CH5 plus when you're way out of the ionosphere because you don't have enough collisional time to actually produce these types of ions. You have HCNH plus, C2H5 plus, C3H3 plus, C3H5 plus. And this is where I talked about where I didn't really want to get too far into the chemistry, but these things are really hard to make when you're up at 3,000 kilometers altitude. So in my opinion, you're, you're pulling these things away from the ionosphere in a sort of uh, uh, flow type of uh, situation because they're being exposed to the fields at that point. They're largely unprotected. So a uh, summary of these observations is shown here. Uh, the velocity is 0 0.8 to 1.5 kilometers per second. We talked about the composition. Um, this, is, these are, you know, this is 725 to 1,500 kilometers above the exabase that we're making this observation. And, and the cutoff here isn't because there's a cutoff in density. The cutoff here is because the spacecraft is, is continuing to roll. So they then go out of the field, field of view. So these things uh, uh, should exist further up. And I'll actually provide some evidence of that as well. Um, we took this opportunity to actually revise our operations on the INMS and to try and use it as a crude plasma spectrometer. You can fix the mass uh, uh, filter on that instrument and then uh, actually tune the entrance aperture such that you get a, uh, a velocity spectrum as you go through it. Um, so we did that and we tried it out on this T86 and we were able to get this sort of crude velocity spectrum for masses 28, 17, and 16. And you can see it sort of falls off of the bottom side of this and that's because of limitations as far as what range you can hit. In this case, in my opinion, this is sort of migrating downwards and we see this in the CAPS data. Oh, excuse me, we're plotting velocity versus altitude. I look at these things enough that I assume that everyone understands them, right? <laughs> um, yes, yes, so, so this is velocity from zero uh, kilometers per second, minus two, two, four, six, eight, uh, and altitude going from the exobase and up. So 1,400 kilometers up to about 2,400 kilometers. And so this is inbound and then outbound on this flyby. So you can see as you get closer to the ionosphere, you see this sort of uptick in, uh, in density for all of these. You can see the, the velocity distribution here for, for mass 28 is, is fairly wide um, as, compo as compared to 17 and 16, but that 17 and 16 are actually uh, uh, higher velocities or fairly uh, uh, a slightly different distribution. And I would also argue that um, on this side, you see this sort of, this decrease isn't because we're missing things, it's actually because they're moving out of our velocity range. Another neat thing to think about here is, is that you're, uh, this is further down tail, this is further upstream, this has more extended on this side, and this is more blunt on this side, which is what you would expect. Um, so we, we did this for the T86, and then we said, well, gee, it would be really nice to get both sides of this and to do a lot better with this. So we revised the operations. We also said we wanted to get a few more masses. And so we then did an, did an observation on T95. And these are the same types of plots. So we have velocity here on the, on the Y, uh, uh, altitude on the X. This is inbound. This is outbound. These are basically polar passes. So you're seeing uh, 1,500 kilometers up to almost 3,000 kilometers here. You see a pretty, pretty nice cutoff in these around 1,800, 1,900 kilometers. And that's probably where you're going from this sort of pressure-dominated regime where things are sort of bubbling up out of the ionosphere to something that's a little bit more dynamical where the, the, the draped fields and, different, and various things are pulling things downstream. Um, so we had this observation. It's really difficult to observe mass two in this instrument, but I plotted it up here anyway just to show that we tried. Um, and we did actually get some observations. It's just it's really hard to make anything out of that data. 
Well, we saw 15, 16, 17, and we saw 28, 29, 30, and 39. And the really interesting thing is, is that we're seeing these really heavy uh, 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 ionospheric compounds being pulled pretty far out of the ionosphere. So there's quite a bit of force going on there. So now to look at a proper plasma instrument, but uh, uh, the trouble with this proper plasma instrument is that we don't have mass resolution. So what we really want to do is, is to use what, I, what we just learned from the INMS to inform us about what, what's going on in the cap spectra. So in this case, we're, I'm showing energy, just energy per charge versus altitude uh, for a, this T-59 flyby. And you can see here is the ionosphere with the C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, and C6 groups all uh, displayed in here. So these are all hydrocarbons that you see deep in the ionosphere. And the really neat part is, is that when you come out of the ionosphere, you see this sort of quick acceleration uh, down tail. And this is C1 and C2 group ions being pulled out of the ionosphere and pushed down tail. And if you look uh, at the pressure regimes in this case, you can see that, that you sort of have this, uh, uh, this inner dynamic, or excuse me, inner thermal pressure uh, that's sort of dominating. This is from, from uh, a work by Demet Olison and, and Ying Zhuo Ma um, about the, the pressure regimes. This inner thermal pressure is allowing things to sort of bubble up. And then you end up with these cases where the dynamic pressure, the various uh, uh, dynamic processes, and the magnetic pressure pile up to push things and accelerate them down tail. So if we look at that same flyby and we have a sort of more complete uh, picture, this is what I just showed you, is this inner region in here. You see the tail way down away from Titan. So we have energy versus time. This is actually distance from Titan and Titan radii. So 3, 8, 12. And you can see these sort of tail features all the way down tail. And you can see there's a sort of, there's a two peak behavior in here. And all of these seem to be these ionospheric ions sort of piling out of the, uh, out of the ionosphere. Also the, the, the structure of this where it has these sort of blips is, is because we're, we're actuating the instrument. So you're coming on and off of the field of view. Um, the other thing to notice here is that this out here is magnetosphere. These are protons, water group ions. And you can see that continue well into the tail. So there's some mixing, and there's some cases where you're sort of looking onto partially filled field lines and things like that. So I've sort of drawn a nice little uh, uh, tail of, of this. Now this energy uh, perturbation in here is it's not really clear what's causing that, and that's sort of been a real head scratcher for me, um, and I haven't really figured that out yet. So open question. We also, there's a grad, uh, uh, grad student at Virginia who's working on this with Bob Johnson and I wanted to show a couple of things from him. He's working you know with the with the CAPS instrument there's three instruments on board there's the electron spectrometer there's the ion beam spectrometer which is a high resolution uh, plasma spectrometer there's also the ion mass spectrometer spectrometer which does composition by time of flight. The trouble with composition by time of flight is is that the mass resolution and various things cause you to have all sorts of headaches when you try to actually fit those time of flight spectra. So he's been digging into this data and trying to pull uh, composition out of these. And so I'm going to show some data from him during the same T40 flyby that, I, that we saw the INMS blip in there. And so what I've shown here is, is the time versus energy. And he's pulled out these different mass groups. So the fans are, you know, you're sweeping across the beam and you're seeing pieces of the beam as it comes out. And so we pick up these various uh, uh, enhancements in the density and he's taken these specific regions and pulled out the time of flight spectrum. So this is time of flight on this axis now, and then just uh, 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 counts on this axis. And he identifies the things in this time of flight pieces as the C1 uh, uh, composition, and this is the C2 composition. So it's fairly consistent with what we showed in the INMS, and it's going way out away from Another thing that, that Andrew pointed out is, is that within a lot of these flybys, this is the T17 flyby, there's also a photoelectron peak that indicates that you're having things that were photoionized produced through a photoionization process being pulled out way down tail. And the same type of thing. Um, I don't think we have a scale of, of Titan radii, but on this specific one, it was, uh, I think, 12 to 15 Titan radii down tail before it cut off. So those two pieces uh, allow us to understand that, you know, the Titan's upper ionosphere is, is actually flowing down tail and is, and is sort of filling in this cavity down tail. Um, there's some misconceptions to some degree uh, about what the composition of that is down tail. People have thought this to be pickup, 
which implies that you have a, uh, a neutral gas source out there that you're ionizing and bringing out there. In my opinion, you're actually seeing this, these flowing from, from the topside ionosphere. Um, I did a very rough thing and tried to figure out what the structure of that ionosphere or that exo-ionosphere or the, the down tail looks like. And so in this data, you can actually say the co-rotational magnetospheric plasma sits mostly above this line and anything that's tightened sits mostly below this line. And you can identify all the locations in the data that show that and actually get a rough structure of, the, of that, that interaction. And so when you do that, you end up with a plot like this. So I'm plotting this in tight interaction coordinates. So the flow is in this direction, Saturn is in this direction, and then the Z is the, nor the general north-south. And I've plotted a you know, body, and I've plotted the uh, uh, exabase, and just a parabola to show a sort of wake structure. And you can see these dots are places where we see Titan-like plasma. So a couple of things come to mind fairly quickly. You see a fairly blunt uh, 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 exit of the ionosphere, a sort of ionopause type of, of uh, structure out here. Another thing that comes up uh, that seems obvious here is, is that you have this sort of almost dual lobe structure, and I sort of draw this out uh, like this, and I try to figure out why it is that we see this type of dual lobe structure and whether this agrees with what was in the Voyager and the early Cassini and now later Cassini flybys that were more cross tail. So the models, uh, uh, some of the hybrid models, this is uh, Sven Simon's uh, paper from 2007, show two things. One, that you can get a dual lobe tail, and two, that you can get a, uh, a tail that's dual lobed and segregated as far as mass. And the reason being is this. Um, if you have these sort of, this pickup of heavy ions, the heavy ions come out with this sort of high, uh, large gyro radius, you know, just due to the mass and the, the uh, convection electric field, they come out with this sort of high gyro radius effect and the pressure of these heavy ions then dominates that region. And so that's, I've overlaid his model on, onto this sort of cartoon to show where these sort of, these heavy ions pull out. So then if you talk about this region as being dominated by heavy ions, and I, we plot over my little uh, diagram here as being roughly the same. If you then look at the B field magnitude in there, you see that that creates a, a cavity in this region, and that cavity uh, allows you to leak light ions out into that region. And so this is where his light ions go in that, in that model. And you can see that there, you then end up with this sort of dual lobed tail because of that. So um, this is a picture that we made for one of, the, one of these nuggets, myself and Hunter and Andrew, um, relating this information where you see the, the low ionospheric um, uh, uh, composition coming out of there. You see ions of ionospheric or origin flowing down tail. You see the cross tail where you actually get the dual lobe structure. And I think that's it. So the conclusions here, Titan's topside ionosphere is composed of ions produced in Titan's ionosphere. These ions are accelerated by the convection electric field into the tail region. Uh, ions of, uh, of Titan origin are observed very far down the tail and the dual lobe structure is observed as well. Thank you. Questions or comments? I mean, we want to finish it, uh, but uh, don't be, okay. Sorry if you said this, but do you have another flyby? You know, that close? Well, we have, we're, we're continuing to fly by over and over again. There's um, hundreds, you know, 118 or something like that planned in the mission. But are they all favorable to seeing your Not all of and them. tails? Yeah. There's so do you have some that are particularly favorable again? Yes. Yeah, we will get a few more in the extended, extended mission. And um, we should, we're, we're now doing this operation every time. Um, and note for anyone that's, that's working MAVEN, you can do this on that instrument too. Joe, what could be interesting is, are there differences for when that, call it that tailward hemisphere is sunlit versus non-sunlit in terms of the supply of plasma? Yeah, I mean, Steve Ledvina did a, did a study on that with the models. Um, he didn't see too much of a difference in, in his modeling approach. Um, in the data, you know, it's, it's something that I haven't pulled out yet, but I would assume that is the case. You, you, you know, whether you're connected to the dayside ionosphere or not, but the other thing to note is, is that these ions have a really long lifetime in the ionosphere. 
So regardless of whether you're connected to the ionosphere, you may still be connected to a supply of ions anyway. Yep, yep. So you may, you may not see the photoelectrons, depending on their lifetime in the upper ionosphere, but you may still see Titan ions. I suppose that could, that could be a possibility. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.